Jesus the rescuer. But you know, before I get started, I was talking with Laura this week. You know, one of my great challenges every week is to have to speak to a whole lot of people who at the end of the day, you really don't want to be here. And uh, when I think about those of you who don't want to be here, I, you could basically be divided into three groups. First group would be those of you uh, who don't like to come to church because see, every time you show up on the weekend, you're reminded of how you're doing everything wrong. Your values are wrong, your priorities are wrong, how you're handling your marriage is wrong, how you're spending your time and your money is wrong, how you're raising your children is wrong. Heck, even how you're having sex, it's just wrong, 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 right? And who wants to get all dressed up and come to church just to be reminded that you're wrong and basically you're ticking God off? And, and I, we don't mean to give that impression and we don't mean to come across that way, but we probably do. But you're like, man, do I really need church? If, do I really need religion if I'm just going to be reminded that there's all these rules and regulations and I'm not getting it right? So that would be one group. Another group would be uh, those who feel like, man, I'm here, but I don't really need church. I don't really need religion. Because, see, in your mind, you kind of got it all going on, right? I mean, you're no Billy Graham. You would be the first one to admit that. Uh, but you're not as bad as most people. And so you're kind of making your way through life, trying to do your best. And, and you feel good about the fact that you're at least average. You know, as long as God grades on the curve and he accepts the A, Bs, and Cs and only rejects the Ds and Fs, you're thinking, I'm probably going to be okay. I'm probably going to get in. But in your mind, I, I can take it or leave it. I don't really need church. I don't really need religion. But, you know, there's interesting, there's a third group that's represented here every weekend, and it would be those of you who have been followers of Jesus for a long, long time. But even as you sit here this weekend at one of our campuses, you don't really want to be here because you feel a little bit alienated, maybe kind of shut out from God. And maybe it's because there was something happened over the summer break. Maybe there's something in your past that you've never really come to terms with. Maybe it's because there's this habit, you've tried everything, but you can't seem to kick the habit. Or maybe it's a habit that you don't want to kick. I mean, right now, you're just having a good time with this habit, and you're thinking, I must really be on God's naughty list because I'm a Christian, and I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. And because of that, you feel guilty, you feel condemned, you don't really want to be here either. But I think this is what's interesting. I really believe that if Jesus was standing here right now, I think this, this is what he would say to everybody that would fall into one of those three groups. I think he would say, and I'm just going to go out on a limb here. I think he would say, you know what? That's the whole problem with religion. Religion just muddies up the relationship that you're supposed to have with God. By the way, what is religion? Let me just give you a simple definition. Religion is my attempt, my effort to work my way into a relationship with God. Religion tells me that if I can be a good person, if I can obey most of the rules, if I can get at least a C minus, at the end, God and I, we're going to be okay. The problem with that logic is, for lots of us, we're not really sure what the rules are that we're supposed to live by. In fact, I, if I were to ask each of you to pull out a piece of paper this morning and write down what are God's top five rules, you know what? We would each have a different list. None of our lists would match. And it's because we have so many rules coming at us from so many sources. I mean, you got the Bible. The Bible's got all the thou shalt's and the thou shalt nots. And then you got to mix in all the rules you learn from your parents, like never, 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 always, 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 you know. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls who do. Those kind of rules you got to work in. And then you've got all the rules that we get from organized religion, things that aren't even in the Bible, rules like you got to have your baby baptized, you got to say Hail Marys, you got to sing the doxology in the service, you got to go into the confession, you got to get through confirmation, you got to have communion every week. And because of all these different sources that are providing all of these different rules, we each have a list of what we consider to be the rules that would be the most important to God. Which brings up the question, whose list do I go by? Well, it was up to me, we go through my list. And number one on my list would be, be nice to Mike. That would be number one on my list of things that's most important to God. See, we, but see, whose list do we go by? For example, maybe a woman who has an abortion is really, really high on your list of things. You're pretty sure that God hates that. You just cannot break that rule. But yet at the same time in your mind, your gossip and your slander about the woman who had the abortion is not as big a deal to God. Do you see how we prioritize and not only do we prioritize, have you guys noticed that we have a, tendence, a tendency to ignore the rules that we're not good at? For example, those of us who like to go to the Golden Corral and belly up to the trough, right? We're pretty sure that gluttony is not, not all that important to God, right? Or for those of you that don't tithe, it's not because the Bible doesn't say you should tithe. You know why you don't tithe? At the end of the day, you feel like, well, tithing, it probably isn't that important to God. 
Or if you don't serve like Tim, we saw in the video, it's because, you know what, it's probably not that important to God that I serve. Or maybe you're not morally pure, and it's like, well, it's probably not that important to God that I want to have sex with my girlfriend before we get married. My point is this, if we're not interested in obeying certain rules, it's just easy for us to justify, you know that rule, it probably isn't that important to God. So at the end of the day, it is very, very confusing. And that's why we're going to see this weekend Christianity isn't about rules. It's not about religion. It's not about going to church. It's about a relationship. And it's a relationship that is built on unconditional love. But this is what we're going to learn. Whenever you try to interject a rule mindset into a relationship that is built on unconditional love, this is what you do. You cancel out the unconditional love. The two just will not mix. I mean, think about the relationships in your life that are based on your performance. How secure do you feel in those relationships? Take work, for example, you know? <laughs> if you don't go to work and do your job, you're out. They don't call you in for your annual review and say, wow, you haven't made a sale in seven years. But we really like having you around, so we're gonna keep you and give you a 10% raise. That doesn't happen. If you don't perform, you're out. Everybody at work may love you. You may be the number one person everybody wants to go to lunch with. But if you don't perform, you're out. So there's this element of insecurity in that work relationship. For some of you, that would describe your marriage. You know, security in your marriage is based basically on how do you perform as a spouse? Do you meet certain expectations as a spouse? And when you don't perform up to a certain level, if you don't meet the expectations, you feel like maybe your spouse thinks you're a loser, you're alienated from them. Maybe they look at you and you feel condemned by them. Why is that? It's because the nature of performance-oriented relationships destroys the relationship by canceling out unconditional love. And since that's the way it is in our relationship, if you wanna be in a relationship with me, you gotta do certain things, you gotta behave certain ways. See, since that's the way it works in our relationships, we naturally look at God and say, that must be how it works when we're in a relationship with God. But if that's the case, we know we're in trouble because we know we're not measuring up. I mean, we know that if, if the key to having an intimate relationship with God is all about getting all the rules right all the time. We know we're in trouble. We know we're on the outside looking in. But the great news about Christianity is that we have a heavenly father who operates off of a completely different system. And that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few minutes as we look at Jesus the rescuer. If you have your Bible this weekend, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Uh, it's the sixth book in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. So it's the sixth book. Romans chapter 8 comes right after Romans chapter 7. Those are the kind of profound truths you will learn if you ever get to go to seminary. So, wow, you're dead this morning. Romans chapter, listen, that's as funny as it's going to get, so I'm sorry. Romans chapter 7. But the one thing I love about Romans chapter 7, this is where the great apostle Paul has a meltdown. This is where he becomes unraveled a little bit. This is the guy who wrote over half of the New Testament, and he has that crisis moment where he gets so frustrated with himself, he basically says, I am a mess. The things I know I'm supposed to be doing, I don't do. The things I know I shouldn't be doing, I find myself doing them all the time. And this is what he says, wretched man that I am. I am an absolute mess. And then you get to Romans chapter 8, verse 1. By the way, chapter breaks are not inspired. They were put there by translators. I don't think there was probably supposed to be a chapter break there. But you get to Romans chapter 8, chapter, verse 1, and it's almost if Paul, rem oh yeah, I forgot. Look at the verse. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. How much condemnation? None. Zilch. Zero. There is now no condemnation for those who are really doing their best to live by God's rules. That's not what it says, is it? But see, that's how we live. The verse says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Do you know what that means? That means that when you became a Christian, when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you became so tight with God that nothing could come between you and God, not even your sin. There is no condemnation. Let me give you a definition for condemn. This is right out of the Random House College Dictionary. Condemn, to pronounce an unfavorable or adverse judgment on, to express strong disapproval of. Now, why is that important? Because most of us, if we're honest, we feel like when we sin, when we disobey God, God disapproves of us. 
But if we go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it tells us that once we become a Christian, once we become a follower of Jesus, get this, God, are you ready for this? God never disapproves of us. God never condemns us. So if you are in Christ, you are uncondemnable. And I'm pretty sure that's not a word, but let's just go with it, okay? You are uncondemnable. Now let's go back to the definition, condemn. To pronounce an unfavorable or adverse judgment on, to express strong disapproval of, to pronounce guilty, to judge or to pronounce unfit for use or service. Look at that last part. To judge or to pronounce unfit for use or service. Now, you know what's said about that statement? You may be here this weekend and you struggle with homosexuality. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, because of the Christian culture, you feel that there is something uniquely wrong about your struggle. And unless I miss my guess, you feel condemned. Unless I miss my guess, you feel unfit for use or service by God. But this is what I want you to know. I want you to know that if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are as in as Billy Graham. You are as in as any pastor on this staff. You are as in as any elder in this church because it isn't about what you did. It's not about what you're doing. Here's the issue at the end of the day. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Some of you right now are going, whoa, 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 Mike, hang on. You're on a slippery slope. Mike, you mean to tell me there's no condemnation even if you kill somebody? Not if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. How about if you're addicted to porn? Mm -mm. Committed adultery? Nope. Had an abortion? Mm -mm. And some of you have been around church for a while. Uh, You're about to have a major coronary. I mean, you're going to be flopping around in the aisle like a fish here in about 30 seconds. It's okay. We got extra medical team here this weekend, and the defibrillators are charged. So, you know, just, just, just relax. Just relax. <clears throat> you know, this is one of those theological messages that this idea sounds so strange, so abnormal to us. Even to those of us who are Christians, we follow Jesus for years. We get a little weirded out when we start talking this way. You know what the problem is? The problem is for many of us, We were saved by grace through faith. We accepted Jesus Christ. We were saved by trusting Jesus as our personal Savior and what he did on the cross on our behalf. We were saved. We made that decision. Do you know what happened? Two two hours later, we reverted right back to the old system, the old behavior. Two hours later, we were trying to follow a bunch of rules because we were convinced that what we do and how we act impacts our relationship with God. But Paul writes to this church at Rome, and he tells them, if you are in Christ there is no condemnation. In other words, if you are in Christ, sin has lost its power to separate you relationally from your heavenly Father. That means that when you sin, God doesn't turn his back. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't roll his eyes because you're in. Now, Paul tells us why, verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus... The law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. And that's clear as mud to most of us. So let me tell you what Paul is saying. He says that as humans, we're used to living life by a philosophy that says, you got to get it right. You've got to do the right things if there's going to be a relationship. Paul says you're used to it. It's got to, you got to be good. you got to do the right thing. you got to meet certain expectations. That's what Paul refers to here in verse 2 is the law or the system of sin and death. This goes all the way back to Genesis. It's cause and effect. You sin, you die, you blow it, you're out, right? That's the system that we're born into. That's the system that we're used to in our earthly human relationships. So it makes sense that we come to church and we hear all these rules, all the thou shalts and the thou shalt nots, and we try to obey all the rules. We can't obey all the rules no matter how how hard we try, we fall on our face, we feel condemned, yet Paul tells us the reason that we're not condemned, even when we break the rules, is because God, look at this, God introduced us to a whole new system, verse 2, he calls it the law of the spirit of life. And he says this new system, it is totally opposite of the one we're used to. Because in this new system, you're not in based on what you do. And in this new system, you don't stay in based on what you do. You're in because of what Jesus 
did. Completely different system. And even though both systems are still operating, the new system overrides the old system. And I thought, how can I explain this new system overriding an old system? Um, I, uh, I was in Haiti, I told you this week. I was a PE major. And uh, what people don't know is it's not just about here's a ball, go play. Uh, when I was a PE major, if you were a science minor, and it made sense because you had to take kinesiology and anatomy and everything else, you, you were on the same track as pre-med. So you had to take chemistry and all the classes that are pre-med. And, and so I had to learn a lot. And, I be, and it was good because when I taught, I was a classroom teacher. I taught science. And for any great teacher, any good teacher, you got to figure out how to take difficult principles and truths and, and make them so someone can understand them, right? And so I taught teenagers. And so take the law of gravity, for example. I came up with this idea. This is the law of gravity. Okay, stuff falls. Okay, that's it. Stuff falls. That, that should help you understand the law of gravity. If it's there, it falls. Now, I was in Haiti this week, and it's time to go home, and we have a 9 o'clock flight out of Miami that's going to get me in about 11.30, and, and we finally get on the plane at Haiti. It's delayed, delayed, delayed. We finally get on. We pull out of the gate. We, we go out on the tarmac, and we just sit there. That's never happened to anyone else, I'm sure. And we sit there, and finally, after about 30 minutes, the pilot comes on, well, I'm so sorry, and apologize for the inconvenience, but we're still waiting on our takeoff instructions from Dallas. And I'm like, I'd feel much more comfortable if I was on the plane with a pilot who actually knew how to take off. He didn't need instructions from Dallas, right? And I'm thinking it can't be air traffic control. People, we're in Haiti. There's like a plane every four hours. It's not like they're just hovering, waiting to get into that country. You know what I'm saying? So we sat there and we sat there and said, nothing happened. Well, it came out again. Oh, I'm so sorry for the inconvenience, but it there might be something in our cargo hold that we need to get out. Oh, really? Why didn't you think about this before you put it in the cargo hold, right? And we sat there for another 30 minutes, and he finally, well, we're going to go back to the gate. Well, by this time, I'm furious because I know I'm going to miss my connection in Miami, and I want to get home. I got, a busy, I got a lot of work to do. And so by this time, I'm like, I'm just checking out. And I'm sitting on the plane, and this is what my thought was. There is no reason in the world that this plane should get off the ground because of the law of gravity. You ever think things like that? You ever just look at it and say, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever? I mean, the plane weighs tons. You got tons of people sitting on the plane. You got tons of their luggage in the cargo hold. I'm thinking there's no way in the world that this should get off the ground. But this is what's interesting. Talk about the law of gravity. I can sit up here and I can, this is my Greek New Testament. I want you guys to know I really do own one. But anyway, um, I can sit up here and I can drop this a million times. It's never gonna fly. It's never going to hover. It's never going to float. It's, it's just going to continue to drop. That is the law of gravity. But I can get on a plane that weighs tons, that's full of people that weigh tons, and all their mess that weighs tons. And as long as there's fuel, I can fly all day long. Why? Did something happen to the law of gravity? Hang on. Nope. It's still working. It's still working. What's the difference? The difference is there's an overriding system. It's called the law of aerodynamics. And when the law of aerodynamics is in place, it overrides the law of gravity. This is what Paul is saying here. You're familiar with the old system. You're familiar with the system of sin and death. You know what that's all about. In fact, you, you spent your entire life operating by this system. It, it, it affects how people treat you and how you treat them in your relationships. But God wants us to understand that Christianity is not a new version. It's not an upgrade of the old system. Christianity is a whole new different thing. And he explains it in verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature. Do you know what that means? It means the law didn't work because of our sinful nature. Nobody could keep the law. It was ineffective when it came to restoring us into a relationship with God. See, Paul says that the law, trying to do our best to please God by obeying all the rules, he says, it just doesn't work. It's powerless when it comes to getting us to God, and it's powerless when it comes to us walking with God. Why? Because the system of doing our best and trying harder and keeping all the rules, see, it's based entirely on our ability to perform. And you know what God says? You've already flunked performance. You've already got an F minus in performance. So you cannot perform good enough to please me, to get back on my good side. So what we could not do in our effort, as humans, what we could not do in our strength, God did. And I got to tell you, that is the fundamental building block of the Christian life. 
What we couldn't do, God did. What did he do? Verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son, the rescuer, in the likeness of sinful man to be an offering. In other words, what the law couldn't do as far as getting us into a relationship with God, God through Jesus Christ accomplished. This is what I wrote in my notes. Where the law was impotent, God was omnipotent. You may want to write that down. That is as deep as I will ever get right there. Where the law was impotent, God was omnipotent. Reminds me of a joke. Can I tell you a joke? It really does fit in with this. I know you're, my wife's like, oh, but anyway, a uh, couple couldn't get pregnant. So the wife went through all the tests, came home, says, nothing wrong with me. Honey, you need to go to the doctor. So the guy goes to the doctor. About three hours later, he comes in, got a white tuxedo on, a big gold chain, top hat cane. And his wife said, what in the world is wrong with you? He said, I went to the doctor. And he said, I'm impotent. If I'm impotent, I'm going to dress impotent. Right? Now, <laughs> this, this has something to do with what I'm going to say. It's this. <clears throat> You can dress up religion. You can dress up rules and regulations. You can make it elegant, liturgical. You can add the pomp and circumstance. But it is still impotent. It is still powerless when it comes to restoring us into a relationship with God. So Paul says here in verse 3, what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son and the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Now look at this. And so he condemned, not man, he condemned sin in sinful man. In other words, he didn't condemn you, he didn't condemn me, he condemned sin. What does that mean to us? It simply means this. It means that once we are in Christ Are you ready? Once we are in Christ, our sin can never separate us from God again. Why? It's because God overpowered that cause and effect, that sin and death relationship. Now, trust me, it's still in play. It's still in play. We're still sinning, right? But God says, in me, it's overcome. In me, it's overridden. In fact, verse 4 goes on to say that it was done. Look at this. In order that the righteousness, the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Do you know what the righteous requirement of the law was? Perfection. It was getting it right all the time, every time. That was what the law required. And no one could do that. And so God says, once you are in Christ, I am giving you. In other words, you can't earn it. You can't achieve it. I am giving you. I am crediting to your account. Ready? Righteousness. I am crediting to your account perfection. You say, well, Mike, if you'd have followed me around this week, I didn't act very righteous. Well, if you'd have seen me sitting on the plane in Haiti, thinking about missing my flight, I didn't act very righteous either. But God says that in Christ, he credits to our lives all the righteousness and perfection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what that means. When God looks at us, if we are in Christ, now, he sees us as righteous He sees us as perfect as he sees his son, Jesus Christ. I like to think of it this way. Uh, I had this coin. Actually, when I I spoke to the University of North Carolina football team, they gave me this little coin. It's got the little football helmet there. And on the back, it says execution, attitude, technique, and heart. Nothing about integrity, by the way. But I have this coin. I have this coin. (laughs) I'm just saying it's not there. that's That's not a statement on anything. It's just not there. But this is you with no integrity, okay? See, again, it had a point, right? But once you're in Christ, when God looks at you, that's what he sees. He sees you as righteous and perfect as his son, Jesus Christ. Now, understand, that's your, that's your position. Positionally, you are perfect and righteous. Day-to-day experience, still down here, still down here. And Paul says that we're in the process, Romans chapter 8, go to the end of the chapter, of being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. 
In other words, as I look back on my life, I may have started down here in my experience, but I'm becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. I'll never get there until I get to heaven, and then I'll be sanctified. But this is the process, experience, but every day my character should be more and more like Jesus Christ. So this is not a message about now that you're in Christ, you can do anything you want to, because you can stay down here and you're going to have a miserable life as a Christian, just so you know that, okay? I think the most miserable person in the world is a disobedient Christian. That's not the point. If you want to experience the John 10, 10, the life, the abundant life, that you, you got you to be conforming into the image of Jesus Christ. So this is the journey. Now, we're never going to get there. But when Jesus, when God says, when I see you, I see you here. I see you as perfect. I see you as righteous. And see, he wants us to operate from this vantage point in our relationship with him. He doesn't want us to revert back to, you know, God was mad at me this week because I looked at porn. But you know what? I had 12 quiet times in three days, and I made it to four small group meetings, and I'm pretty sure I'm back in. No. Or God's really mad at me because I kicked the neighbor's dog, but you know what? I said six Hail Marys, and I tied this week. So I'm pretty sure I'm back in good standings. Right. No. I think when we do that, God looks at us and says, stop it. That's religion. That's the old system. And my son had to die to rescue you from that system. And through his death... I've given you his righteousness. And there's not a thing you can do to alter my love and acceptance of you. Let me give you an illustration and we'll close. I have two boys. They're not boys anymore. They're young men. And uh, you know what? They're like any other, anybody else's kids. They, sometimes they screw up. Sometimes they do dumb things. And you know why they do that, by the way? Because they're like their dad. They're like their dad, Right? I love it. If you go to the beginning of Genesis, God said, let us create man in our image. And God created Adam perfect and righteous. But when you get to Genesis chapter 5, and Adam had his first son, Seth. You know what it says? And he was created in his daddy's image. He was a sinner like his dad. And there are times that we have a little bit of arguments, and there are times that they do things. But let me tell you something. I mean, does it, do you think it factors in to my behavior and my feelings toward them? Mm -mm. Not at all. You know why? They're my son. They'll always be my sons. And no matter what they do, we will always be as tight and we will always be as close as we have ever been because they are my sons. In the very same way, as a Christian, when God looks at you, I don't care what you've done. There's no condemnation. There's no separation. There's not a sliver of sin that can slide in between you and God that could ever alter, are you ready, his love and acceptance of you. Because you didn't get in by being good. And he doesn't love you because you're staying good. He loves you because you were declared righteous when you received his son as your savior. And he says, once you did that, there's no potential for condemnation. Now let me just say this. If you're here this weekend and you have never received Jesus Christ as your savior, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Let me just give you the bad news first. The bad news is this, you are condemned. You are condemned. But it's not because of anything you've done. It's because you, like me, we were born into a world that says you have to perform. And by the way, that's all it takes in this world is to be born. We're all born sinners. Total depravity. You know that doctrine. The good news is that this weekend, you can be reborn. And you can be taken out of a state in condemnation, of condemnation and you can be put into a state of total acceptance by God. And you'll be so tight with God, there's, it will be impossible for anyone to be any tighter with God than you are. And all you have to do is accept this gift of righteousness, receive the gift of Jesus Christ, accept him as your savior, your rescuer. You accept the fact that what he did on the cross was, was enough to pay for your sins. And when you accept it, see God stamps right over your life. Righteous. Righteous. Now, I wasn't planning on, on ending the service this way this weekend, but uh, as I was sitting in my office Friday, I decided, yeah, I think that's what God wants us to do. I'm going to pray in just a second. And then after I pray, we're going to dismiss, and I'm going to ask you to do something. It'll be a little bold, but I'm going to ask you, if you have never 
except the God's free gift of salvation. In other words, you've been all about religion, jumping through the hoops, trying to obey the rules, trying to go to church, trying to take the right classes, trying to do the right thing, but you've never accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, his payment for your sins so that you could have a relationship with God. I'm going to ask you just to come down here and sit along these front rows. And we have small group leaders and staff, and we have people that are trained in our care ministry, and they're just going to come alongside of you. And if you will give us five minutes, five minutes, we want to introduce you to Jesus. And we want you to understand in five minutes how you can experience the righteousness where you will never have to feel condemned again. You will never have to feel alienated again. doesn't mean you won't sin. It doesn't mean you won't confess it. But as far as your position with God, you'll never have to worry about that again. But see, it's not just for this life. It's also for eternity. I mean, we're talking eternal ramifications. You're going to spend life somewhere forever. We all have eternal life. It's just a matter of where you're going to spend it. And the Bible says there's two options. You're going to spend it with God in heaven, or you're going to spend it in a place called hell that originally God created, not for us, but for Satan and his demons. But because of our sin, nobody is chosen to go to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. If you go to hell... You choose to go there. But by accepting the righteousness of Jesus Christ, <laughs> you're saying, I don't want to go there. Now, let me tell you why this is so important. I accepted Christ when I was five years old. I bet you I accepted Christ 20 times a year until I was about 20 years old. I cannot tell you how many times I sit in church, God, if I wasn't, wasn't, wasn't saved last week, because I don't think I was based on what I did. So I, uh, I want to make sure I'm saved this time. You ever done that? You ever done that? And then the next week, oh, ooh, I wouldn't have done that if I would have been saved. So I must, if I wasn't saved last week, I'm going to be saved. You know what? What I want to offer you in five minutes can change your eternal destiny. And I think it's worth your time. So I'm going to pray, and everybody else is going to leave. And if you'll just come down here, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes with you. We're going to pray with you, and we're going to let you go. But don't let pride cause you to miss this opportunity to settle it once and for all. Father, thank you that while we were yet sinners, while we were sinners, <laughs> there was nothing about us that was even attractive. You gave your son to die for us. And it's because we know that from the very beginning, even when Adam and Eve disobeyed you, even when the fall took place, the Bible is nothing more than an epic love story of your pursuit to be in a relationship with us. And you desire it so much, you said, I will give my most priceless possession to make it possible. But Father, we have to be humble enough to realize we cannot get to you on our own. No matter how good, many good deeds, how many times we feed the poor, or go work for Habitat, it doesn't matter. It's about, do we have a relationship with you that's made possible because Jesus Christ died for our sins. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone that wants to be in a relationship with the Father has to go through me. I pray for all the people that are listening to me right now at all of our campuses and the frustration of being on that treadmill of religion that gets you nowhere but frustrated. May they find peace today. And may they walk out of here knowing that if they were to get hit in the, in the parking lot and never see the light of another day, they would spend all eternity with you. It blows my mind that you would love us that much. But we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen.